Hello, my name is Ed Farnan and I'm one of the medical legal advisors at the Medical Defence Union and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on the medical legal aspects of remote consultations. I'm joined this morning in the background by two of my advisory colleagues, Dr. Ed Nandasoma and Dr. Sam Bell, who will be fielding your questions as we go along, um, which you can submit to us via the, the menu on the webinar site. We expect about a thousand or more participants this morning, so we may not be able to answer all questions individually, but when I finish the presentation, Sam, Ed and I will be discussing the questions which you put to us and trying to pick out the most common themes or the most frequently occurring questions. If you join late or if you have to leave early, we will be putting the uh, webinar live on our, as live on our website from next week, and you will also receive a certificate of attendance. So without further ado, I will make myself invisible uh, and we will commence the, the presentation. So what we'd like to discuss this morning really in broad terms are some practical tips some relevant parts of GMC guidance and also some general medical legal issues arising out of the concept of remote consultations. The questions which doctors have been asking us uh, in relation to remote consultations to some extent mirror the questions we get asked about in general about face-to-face -face consultations, namely issues about consent, confidentiality, record keeping and good communication. And in, in addition to that, specific to the remote consultation environment, we have been receiving questions about continuity of care, assessment of patients, and at the end, we will touch on a, a, the issue of indemnity. What I should say at the start is that this is not a presentation about clinical skills. Um, this is very much trying to focus on some of the medical legal issues which you might encounter. There are some very good resources available for practical clinical skills and how those can be used in a remote setting. I've highlighted a number here, both from the NHS and other providers. And in addition to these, there are some which are available from other Royal Colleges and professional bodies, which are specific to individual specialties or different systems. Uh, and they're fairly widely available. By way of background, although the coronavirus pandemic has forced people's hands somewhat in consulting remotely and using different means, this is something which has been on the agenda for some time. Um, as far back as 2014, there was a government commitment to increase spending on video calling in general practice. There has been some academic research into this. And in addition, Again, prior to the pandemic becoming an issue, there was an agenda that both online and video consultations would be available much more widely, certainly within England. So I mentioned that we would be looking at some GMC guidance. Um, all of the GMC guidance will, will apply in a remote setting just as it does in face-to-face -face consultations. But what we hope to do this morning is to, to pick out some of the more relevant points. And the GMC has also, on its own website, collated all of the relevant information as it sees it from its other guidance, such as its good medical practice, confidentiality and consent guidance, and has put that all together on a remote consultation ethical hub available on their website, which is where this image and this flowchart has come from. We'll look at a lot of these issues in more detail as we go on, but really just to pick out some of the fairly high level uh, key principles um, that the GMC has advocated. Some of these would appear to be fairly self-evident. For example, that when you're consulting remotely, um, you should of course make sure that you are speaking to the right person. For example, if you are telephoning somebody at their home, there may be two or perhaps even three generations living under the same roof, uh, some or all of whom may have very similar names. So it's very important that you do ensure that you are speaking to the right person uh, to avoid A, a breach of confidentiality and B, 
giving poor advice. This is a different scenario to the usual face-to-face -face consultation. It's something which patients may be less familiar with, so it's important to make sure that they are ready for the consultation to begin and that they're familiar with what will be happening. Uh, and you might need to take a little extra time for that to get them familiarized with it. Uh, otherwise, the consultation can get off on, on the wrong foot. And again, what we will discuss slightly more detail later on is, is the importance of using appropriate systems. We'll go over some of that GMC guidance in more detail later, but just to, to move on to some practical tips. This is information which was published by NHS England fairly early on in the coronavirus pandemic, around about the time that lockdown first happened. And it suggested that there are some consultations which are perhaps more suitable for uh, a remote setting. And they gave, as an example, some routine chronic disease checkups, which are particularly amenable to being dealt with remotely. They also highlight that some administrative issues and counselling can be dealt with that way, and I would suggest that those are interpreted fairly broadly. It's not simply, for example, counselling in the psychotherapeutic sense, but also counselling about disease processes, diagnoses, counselling about new medication. That can, for the most part, be done remotely in many cases. Triage is something which they highlighted, and I think that is, is fairly self-evident in the sense that by definition, triage will offer you the opportunity of doing things other than a remote consultation, such as a face-to-face -face assessment, if that's deemed to be necessary. And in each of these, there is the, the need to have a trade-off between the, the advantages and the convenience of the remote medium with the disadvantage that you might not be able to do everything that you could do face-to-face. -face. And there is a certain amount of balancing that has to be done. Just as there were some consultations which are suitable for a virtual setting, there are others which might be less suitable. And again, the first of these seems to be fairly self-evident in that if somebody needs to be physically examined in a way that can't be done remotely, and if that examination can't be deferred, then a remote setting is probably not the way to assess that patient. There is a certain amount of um, a learning curve which has to happen with, with new technologies. And certainly until both doctor and patient is familiar with it, your threshold for seeing somebody face to face might still be quite low, uh, subject to other restrictions that are currently in place. Finally, I think it's worth highlighting that for deaf and hard of hearing patients, um, video may not be the most suitable thing for a consultation, even though they can see your face and perhaps see your lips. My understanding is that lip reading is itself a fairly three-dimensional skill, and you lose one of those dimensions, perhaps, when you are consulting with a two-dimensional video screen. So in practical terms, from your own perspective and within your own organizations, it's helpful to perhaps plan in advance where you are going to be consulting remotely, who might be able to seen, sorry, who might be able to be seen remotely, and also work out agreed criteria for how patients who need to be seen face-to-face -face can be. And that has to be done in a way which is safe both for, for you and for the patient. Uh, and certainly in the, in the context of the, the pandemic, things that will need to be taken into consideration there will be the availability of PPE uh, and facilities where patients can be seen in a way which still maintains an appropriate distance. And clearly the most practical thing of all is that if you are going to be consulting remotely, the facilities and the technology have to be in place to allow you to do that. When we talk about remote consultations, we really mean things done by telephone, by video, and online. Um, in a, a, a telephone setting, I think most doctors are fairly familiar with that. It's something which we've been doing for a long time. Online is perhaps slightly more niche, and there are particular skills associated with that. I think what we're hoping to focus predominantly on this morning and this afternoon is the the concept of video consulting, because that is, I think, which is what has been, to some extent, the most significant potential growth industry, uh, which has happened over the last, perhaps, six months or more. From, again, from a practical perspective, we, we should ask ourselves, who is involved? Who is the clinician? Are you the doctor um, best placed to do that? Uh, and are you comfortable with doing that? And that, again, comes back to the concept of this learning curve, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, 
I mentioned the importance of checking the patient identification, but also then I, determining that a remote consultation is indeed appropriate for that patient. And finally, um, I will come on to this later in much more detail, but who else is present both at your end and at the patient's end? And I think the important thing about that is that you should be prepared to revise whether a remote consultation is appropriate during the course of the consultation based on your assessment of this and whether things may change with more information becoming available. For example, uh, this is taken from the, the GMC's Good Medical Practice, which is their core guidance. And one thing which they say is that where necessary, you must examine a patient. So during a remote consultation, if the need to examine a patient in a way that can't be done remotely becomes apparent, then you may need to change your approach. And some of the guidance which I referred to in one of my opening slides from the NHS and other bodies shows that some examinations can indeed be carried out in a remote setting, but perhaps not all. We ask ourselves, therefore, how is a remote consultation different from a face-to-face -face consultation? And, and while you mull that over, I will just say again, for anybody who has joined us slightly late, that this webinar will be available on our website um, from next week, hopefully. So if you've missed anything, you can catch up. Similarly, if you do have to leave early, you can see what you've missed uh, at the end on the website. And we will be sending out certificates of attendance again, hopefully next week. And there is, as I say, the facility for questions to be posed to my colleagues who are working in the background um, via the, the app or the, via the software. So how is a remote consultation different from a face-to-face -face consultation? Well, I think you lose many of the, the soft clues that you might pick up when you're seeing somebody face-to-face. -face. You lose some of those if you're doing it by video, perhaps more by telephone and more still if you're doing it online. And these are the things that you, you will have developed over many years of, of clinical practice, simply gaining experience in spotting things that the patient might not tell you, but which you determine are relevant. So the fact that you have lost those um, may be something which is important to bear in mind. I think as long as you're aware that the, the, the medium that you're using has its own limitations, you can work around that. A consultation, whether it be face-to-face, -face, remote or other, uh, has a particular structure. It has a beginning, a middle and an end, and I think it's helpful to break those down. Um, the introduction is important to get right because a, a bad introduction is hard to recover from. It's important to try and establish an agenda with the patient so that you and they both understand what the purpose of the consultation is and what can reasonably be achieved. Otherwise, you know, valuable time can be wasted going off at tangents or perhaps in a, in a mutual misunderstanding. Sometimes it's sensible to start with a short discussion or a checklist about things that do need to be dealt with in advance with your perhaps your administrator hat on, which might include issues of consent or third parties, which we'll look at later. And only once you've dealt with those issues should you then move on to become the clinician, which is the primary purpose of the of the consultation. And clearly setting those boundaries and doing that little bit of housekeeping in advance can pay dividends. The meaty bit of the consultation is, is very much the, the middle. Um, it's where you try and gather information about the patient and why they're attending, and then providing information to the patient about what the next steps might be. And I think in a remote setting, it's helpful to have in your own mind some form of structure to do this because to some extent, by definition, a remote consultation is, is, is less likely to be successful because of the, the structure that it, it can lose. So if you keep that structure, rather than have the perhaps the fluidity of a face-to-face -face consultation, you're more likely to succeed. And I think one of the important things is to, to try and maximize your reflections back to the patients. And then at the end, what you will want to do is, is to to check that the agenda has been satisfied, if that is possible, clearly, in some cases, you will not necessarily be able to satisfy a patient's particular and specific agenda, but ensure that you have satisfied it to, to the best of your ability and explain where you can't. To summarize and check the understanding, uh, and importantly, particularly in a remote setting, to negotiate the next steps, so to explain to the patient what they can expect should happen, whether that be a face-to-face follow-up,
or other arrangements, and also from a safety netting perspective, what the patient should do if something unexpected or untoward happens. If I can talk about some information which is perhaps on the face of it fairly basic, um, but bearing in mind this is a medical legal talk, what we're sometimes trying to do is to prevent problems and prevent, for example, patients complaining. One of the things patients like is for their, their treating clinicians to appear professional. And if this is a, a, a medium which is going to be used more often, then it's helpful to try and look as professional as you can. Dress professionally if you can do. Um, think about lighting. Um, simple placement of lights or lamps if they're available can improve the quality of lighting. It can mean that the patient can see you better and see your face better and be reassured by that. It's helpful to think about the background. What, what you don't want to do is to look essentially like a, a police mugshot or a, a hostage video, which is it's unhelpful and doesn't instill confidence. It's helpful to have a clear desk, and I, and I say a clear desk both in the, the physical sense of the, the, the desk that you're working on, but also a clear desktop in a virtual sense. Uh, so it's important that nothing that shouldn't be visible is visible. Um, for example, patient confidential information, perhaps about other patients, if you are sharing your screen, for example. It's very important that if you can do to avoid interruptions, um, avoid other background noise and so on. In preparation for this webinar, for example, I've switched off my landline, disconnected the telephone, um, disconnected the doorbell, and have instructed my wife and six-year-olds to go out for a walk in the hope that they will not interrupt. Video security is obviously a concern, so it's important that where possible that any video conferencing software that you're using is approved. You should turn off any default settings which might exist for recording. Ideally, you should use approved hardware and software, but you can use other products um, if approved versions are not available. But try and ensure that everything you are using is secure, for example, avoiding public Wi-Fi. If you are forced to use your own device, then you should not store patient identifiable information on that. And in the background, particularly if you're working from home, you should disable and turn off things like virtual assistants, because the last thing you want is for them to become involved in some way, even inadvertently, in a consultation with a patient. And if you are, again, using your own device, make sure that you do switch off any facilities on the software, which allows sharing of information across devices. Again, this might seem a strange thing to raise in a, a, a discussion of medical legal aspects, but one of the things that patients can and do complain about is if they think that a doctor has not paid attention. And if you are in the room with a patient and you turn away from them to type or to make notes, that in itself sometimes triggers a complaint. In a remote setting, if you are looking at the screen, which is what you will want to do to see your patient, it will appear to them that you're not making eye contact, whereas if you do what they will want, which is to look at the camera and make eye contact from their perspective, you will no longer be able to see them, which is what you want to do. So it's important to perhaps glance at the camera so that they think that you are occasionally making eye contact, or perhaps more importantly, explain that the appearance of lack of eye contact is because you're trying to focus on what you're needing to see. And if you explain that in advance, perhaps as part of your housekeeping at the start, it might prevent further problems and complaints at a later stage. I mentioned at the start uh, the possibility that third parties might be present, and that can be third parties who are present both with you in, in your professional capacity, but also third parties who might be present with the patient, whether that be a, a family member or a carer. And in many cases, a patient will find it helpful to have somebody else there just to confirm their understanding of what was said to make sure that they don't miss anything out. It's important to clarify if there is a third party at either end who that is and to document that clearly. It's important to document also in what capacity they're joining. Um, and if you want somebody to join at your end, it's helpful and important to seek consent from the patient. That might be somebody attending uh, as a trainee in order to gain familiarity with the technology or just as part of their clinical training. 
it might be an interpreter, and in common, in common situations, it may well be a chaperone. If you do need to examine a patient, you should consider asking the third parties to leave or to switch off their camera, although that's less likely to be appropriate if the chaperone is there, as that's the point where their attendance is perhaps most relevant. I also mentioned the importance of seeking consent at various times. Um, the fact that somebody has agreed to participate in a, a video consultation or a telephone consultation may in itself be taken as consent to do so, but it's important to bear in mind that consent is not just a single point in time, it is an ongoing and dynamic process. And if you think that something has changed, uh, and you should have your antennae up for this, you may need to revisit whether a continued remote consultation remains appropriate. And there are specific issues in relation to third parties, which we've discussed in sharing of images, for example, which we'll come on to later, where specific consent may need to be sought. And again, these are issues which might be appropriately dealt with in your initial housekeeping at the start of the consultation. I've touched on the issue of chaperones. Uh, chaperones, as we all know, um, are recommended in, in certain uh, clinical encounters uh, as a minimum, uh, and perhaps also in others. And their primary purpose is very much to preserve patient safety, dignity, and comfort. But as we all know that if a concern is subsequently raised that a doctor has in some way acted inappropriately, uh, the fact that a, a chaperone was present will also be very helpful in protecting the clinician's interests. Ideally, it should be a suitably trained healthcare professional and one familiar with the, the examination for which a chaperone is required. It's generally not appropriate that it is a, a patient's relative or a friend, but of course, if the patient wants somebody else to be present for that reason, then it may also be appropriate for them to attend in addition to the chaperone. As with a face-to-face -face consultation, if a chaperone is used, then you should record the fact that that was the case and also who that chaperone was, or record that a chaperone was offered but declined. There may well be practical difficulties in terms of offering chaperones in a remote setting. Um, and if that's the case, then either because one is unavailable or because a chaperone can't see what you need them to see, you should consider whether it is entirely appropriate for the consultation and the examination to proceed remotely at all, taking into consideration the patient's immediate clinical needs, uh, which obviously must take precedence and priority. I highlighted this guidance uh, at the start, and there is guidance here and elsewhere available from NHS England on the use of chaperones and intimate examinations. I mentioned that we would be discussing in brief um, online consultations in addition to video and telephone consultations, and I would make a point of flagging up this particular piece of guidance, which I think is useful, and again, is something which to most, to the, for the most part predates the pandemic. It was something which was in, in, in play already, and it's quite detailed and useful guidance on uh, online consultations, particularly in primary care, but with applicability across the NHS and other sectors. Just to touch on it briefly, I think it is particularly a, a new technology which patients may not be terribly familiar with, and indeed many doctors may not be terribly familiar with. I think it's important to manage expectations both in terms of the patient's expectations in terms of a response time, in terms of how quickly you will be able to respond if a patient contacts you by some of the remote means that are available. It's not likely to be like a chat room, for example, where there will be an immediate turnaround. So patients do need to be made aware of what they should or can do if they have symptoms that do need urgent attention rather than something which can be done with on a more routine basis. It's helpful from your perspective to know what the strengths and weaknesses of any systems that you're using are. This is, as I say, with other mediums, something which there will be a learning curve for. Um, and while we will all have been patients at some stage in our lives and have been to see a doctor and will understand what that's like, we may be less familiar with the patient's perspective of a remote online access system. So it's helpful to understand, if you can, what the patient experience is 
um, and it may, may make your use of the system as a doctor more efficient and more effective for the patient if you can do. One issue which may have particular relevance to an online setting but perhaps applies elsewhere as well is when you're consulting with those who are under 16. Uh, some remote consultation providers, for example, do require the presence of an adult if you're consulting with a child, and that may have, by extension, implications for your indemnity provider were you to consult with a patient um, in this age group without the presence of an appropriate adult. In general, an adult should be present uh, if you're consulting remotely with a child. And you should document who that is. It would, it would usually be a parent, and if it's not a parent uh, or somebody with parental responsibility, then you may wish to ask why, just for your own reassurance. If the patient, the child patient, does ask to speak with you without an adult parent pre present, then I think you have to take into consideration whether or not they have capacity or whether they're competent. Raise in your own mind whether those that that, that request could trigger a safeguarding concern, and both with children and with, with vulnerable adults about whom there may be safeguarding concerns, I would suggest that you do have a, a low threshold for a face-to-face -face assessment. Doctors are very good at picking these things up by soft markers, um, and you should have a low threshold, and as I say, trust, trust your instincts. I said we would touch briefly on record keeping, and this again is from the GMC's core guidance. The primary purpose of making a good and detailed clinical record is to ensure that the patient's ongoing clinical care is, is appropriate, and so that either you or anybody else dealing with the patient after you will have a clear picture of what happened at any given consultation. It's important to record um, the history that you obtained, your examination findings, including what you looked for, but also what you looked for didn't find, um, your management plan and your working diagnosis. And that's all important for the purposes of clinical care, but it's also enormously helpful to the MDU if at some stage later a patient raises a concern um, or if there are other issues which you may need to address. And that helps us enormously in protecting your position if the record is, is good and detailed. With particular reference to record keeping in a virtual setting or about a virtual consultation, I would suggest that you do record how the consultation took place. Record why it was a remote consultation rather than a face-to-face. -face. Commonly at present, that will be because of the restrictions imposed by the pandemic. As I said before, you should record who was present where possible, but also any limitations which you noticed were there because of the, the medium and what you did to try and overcome that where possible. And as well as recording the details of the consultation, recording any safety netting advice and follow-up arrangements is important and helpful. The GMC is clear that you must inform patients in advance and also obtain their consent in advance if you intend to record a consultation. You should also explain how that consultation and how that recording will be stored and for how long. You should record consent for that in the clinical record. And the recording forms part of the clinical records and should be treated in the same way. I would advise that you ensure that appropriate security arrangements are in place if the information is to be stored or sent or received in line with the NHS Digital Code of Practice. And bear in mind, the GMC requires that if you're responsible for patient data, for example, if you're a GP partner or in private practice, it must be dealt with in accordance with data protection and any other relevant laws. During your consultation with a patient, you may feel the need to prescribe. Um, the GMC has got specific prescribing guidance. And within that specific prescribing guidance, there is a specific section on prescribing in a remote setting. Some of this, again, is, seems fairly self-evident that if you're going to, to, to prescribe a drug, then you must satisfy yourself that you can make an adequate assessment. You should consider the limitations of the medium for this and other reasons, as we've discussed, and also the need for a physical examination or other assessment and whether, whether you have had access to the records. 
you should ensure that instructions for the administration or monitoring of the drugs are clearly understood and perhaps have a lower threshold for giving written advice than you would do perhaps in a face-to-face -face consultation, again, because of the limitations of the medium. Within the GMC guidance, there is a specific requirement for uh, to follow up in writing um, any advice about prescri prescribing for patients who are in a hospice or in a care home. And the final box there is just to reinforce the GMC's guidance that you should not prescribe, indeed you must not prescribe, uh, non-surgical cosmetic treatments in a remote setting. Those things do require a face-to-face -face physical assessment. I mentioned recording a short time ago. Um, the GMC's guidance, and there's some additional supplementary guidance which we have added to our own website, um, applies to photographs as, as well as to other audio and visual recordings. So if you work in, a, in an NHS trust, you should familiarize yourself with, as well as the GMC guidance, any local information governance policies. If you are going to share image or to ask a patient to share images, I think firstly you should ask yourself if a remote consultation is the most appropriate method of arriving at a safe diagnosis and treatment plan where you or the patient think a photograph is necessary. In other words, will an image be enough or do you need to undertake a more extensive examination of the patient? And addressing this question at the start may help to prevent problems later. You should consider the issues of consent and the, the GMC's advice is that specific consent is required to both receive and store a patient's photograph, irrespective of whether it's your idea or the patient's. The process of obtaining and documenting consent should be, include explaining why a photograph will help in providing clinical care. You should explain to the patient how the clinical records, including the photographs, will be securely stored and that it won't be used for any other purpose without their express permission. And you should document these concerns and decisions in the, in the clinical records. If the patient is a, a child who lacks capacity to make a decision about a photograph of them being shared, you should seek uh, permission of someone with parental responsibility. And if the patient is an adult who lacks capacity, you must be satisfied in your own mind that the photograph is necessary and will be of benefit to them and in their best interests. And in the situation of an adult without capacity, it may be important to, to clarify if there is anybody else who has legal authority to act on a patient's behalf. You should agree with the patient how the image will be sent to you. And if this is by email, ideally it should be by your secure NHS encrypted email account uh, and used in conjunction with your organization's policies. You should upload that image to the patient's record and then delete the email and the image from your account. The same applies if you're using text message or similar means to, to transfer photographs. If the patient does not agree to the retention of, of the photograph on their clinical records, that may make it retrospectively more difficult to understand the advice you gave and the treatment recommended. And in those cases, you may need to consider whether a remote consultation is the, the safest way to proceed. One question which we've had frequently during lockdown is regarding the appropriateness of sharing intimate images, which for the most part will involve genitalia, the anus or the breasts. And these do create a particular medical legal risk. And in a normal clinical consultation where an intimate image is required, then a chaperone would generally be offered, which may not be possible to replicate in, in a remote environment. It's also possible that the image alone may be insufficient to reach a safe clinical diagnosis. And for example, something like palpation may be required or indeed samples. If you're dealing with frail patients and those who lack capacity, they may need assistance from others trying to obtain an intimate image. And this could seriously impact on their dignity or be an unreasonable image, sorry, an unreasonable burden to the family or carers. So if, if there is a need to obtain an intimate image in a clinical setting and it's not possible to safely defer the consultation, the question arises as to whether a remote consultation is appropriate. And you may wish in those circumstances to consider whether you should see the patient in person or indeed uh, make other arrangements for them to be seen. One question which has come up is the issue of 
intimate images of the under 18s and uh, to some extent the concern here is that um, the taking of those images as well as the sending and receiving of them could possibly lead to a criminal investigation and while there may well be a, a very legitimate defence to any criminal allegations that might be made arising from that it's impossible to give a 100% guarantee that it would not trigger an investigation and therefore for that reason again I think a degree of, of prudence is required in terms of deciding whether that's the most appropriate way of dealing with patients in that situation. A couple of final points, uh, firstly is in relation to other staff, particularly if you are in a management role. Uh, the GMC's guidance on delegation would apply here as in other settings and it's important that you consider uh, whether patients or whether staff, I beg your pardon, do have the appropriate skills and experience to consult with patients remotely? Do they need additional training or supervision, for example? And how is that going to be monitored? What are the governance uh, implications for that? And a final point, which I said we would touch on very briefly at the end, which is that we know that doctors are consulting patients differently, particularly during the pandemic uh, and the various levels of lockdown. And even as that is eased, I suspect that video consultation will become a more common feature of, of clinical practice. You don't need to inform the MDU if you're doing your work by remote means, such as by video, if it's simply the normal work that you would have done previously, other than by a different means. But if you are taking on new work that you haven't previously told us about, you can contact our membership department uh, on this email address uh, and they can clarify any additional steps that might need to be taken. I hope that was useful. We will take some questions now, but I would remind you again that at the end of this presentation, or hopefully next week, you will receive a certificate of attendance. The session has been recorded and will go on to our website uh, next week, I hope. So if you've missed the start or have to leave early, uh, that information and the, the full webinar will be available. And I will there then pass the questions over and hopefully my colleagues Edna and Soma and Sam Bell, who've been working in the background, will be able to discuss some of these questions with me. Hi Ed, thank you. Thank you for that. That was uh, incredibly interesting. We have had a lot of questions, um, a, a lot about um, the use of intimate images, and um, I've been directing um, a, a lot of the participants to the RCGP guidance on on the use of sort of remote intimate assessments. Um, a lot of people have been kind of asking about. Um, uh, uh, about the use of uh, use of intimate images, and I think, um, do you want to go over the key messages on on that again? I, th I think the, the the main point we were saying is, look, make sure that your patients know um, how the images are going to be used. Make sure you receive them securely and not on personal devices, and make sure you've got a really well documented clinical justification, particularly if you're dealing with with children. Is is do you want to just go over those points again? Because I think it's been a real point of interest. Yeah, I think I think the first thing to say is that one of the things we say at the start is that it, the importance of consent uh, for each part of this process can't be underestimated. So it's important that the patient agrees in principle that that they're happy for you to examine them remotely in the first instance. Uh, once that agreement and that consent has been obtained, then if the images are going to be shared, if there is, for example, going to be a photograph of, of a particular intimate image sent across to you, then there is specific requirement from the GMC, whether it's an intimate image or not, uh, that that is agreed in advance and that the patient understands how that image will be stored, um, how that will form part of their clinical record and for how long it will be stored, which will be much the way that other clinical records are retained. Uh, with respect to, to the intimate image, I think the same advice applies in terms of the sharing of the image. I think the difficulties which can occur in relation to intimate images specifically related to the practicalities, uh, which are that there will be other things often attended on an examination of an intimate part of the body other than just visualizing it. It's often not sufficient simply to visualize what you're doing uh, 
you will often want to, as I say, obtain samples, perhaps uh, palpate. And in those situations, you will need to consider whether you can conduct a safe and appropriate assessment simply by doing it visually or obtaining an image. Uh, and the threshold for deciding whether or not that's the way to go in the first instance or whether another way of consulting with the patient, whether it be a face-to-face -face assessment on the same day or if it could be safely deferred until a short time later, I think that's the consideration at that point. Um, thanks, Ed. I'll, I'll just to develop that a little further, we've also had a question about um, whether um, if, if you're undertaking a consultation with somebody who is uh, sort of under 16, is it mandatory to have a parent or guardian um, with that patient? I think that depends on the circumstances of the consultation. I, I raised that point because I'm aware that some of the providers, I think in particular some of the providers of online consultation services require that, um, and that's a requirement of the, of the provider. Uh, and because that's a requirement of the provider, I think to some extent there is an extension for indemnity purposes that, that might become relevant in that context. So it's important if you're using some of those online providers to clarify what the contractual requirements are with them, um, there will be circumstances where it may be appropriate um, to consult with a patient who is under 16 remotely, just as there will be circumstances where there's a, a, an option to do that face to face. Those will be unusual, I think. And I, I suspect in many cases, you will not be able to satisfy yourself that it's entirely appropriate to consult them remotely. Uh, as I say, there may be contractual elements to that which, which tie your hands somewhat, but even without those, I think you need to have a low threshold for seeing those children face to face because there may be other issues which you can't really tease out uh, necessarily and you can't be entirely satisfied that there aren't safeguarding concerns in some situations um, without doing it face to face. But I think each case needs to be judged on its own clinical merits. Some things are, are much more clinically straightforward than others. Edit Sam here. There's quite a few um, questions about storage of records, in particular in, about, about pictures. And I know you touched on that, but is that something that's just worth touching on again, do you think, maybe? Yeah, so I, again, I think in the ideal situation is that you will agree this in advance with the patient. Um, but the GMC's guidance is clear that the, the guidance applies even if the patient sends you an unsolicited image, in a sense, without your prior agreement. The important thing is that the patients need to be made aware that consent is required uh, for, you to, for, for you to share that image or for, rather for them to share that image. You should obtain their consent in advance wherever possible and also then explain to them what the arrangements are for storing that image securely. They will be often very, I think, reassured that the image will be used for the purpose that it was provided, which is for their direct clinical care and that you will not use it for any other purpose, for example, for research. Um, or for teaching purposes without their explicit and express consent. I think that discussion with the patient in advance is the important thing and the, the GMC's guidance which is available on their website I think is is quite helpful in this sense because it, it's, it's a useful reminder for all doctors um, as to what the expectations are and it, it's if, if that is reinforced in our own minds before we consult with patients then we can be reassured that we're doing the right thing and perhaps avoid things being done perhaps without without that due consideration. Thanks, Ed. And, um, Ed, I've got a, another question here about whether we would recommend that uh, uh, practices have a call recording system in place to capture telephone consultations or or similar, I wonder, I think that might be of more general interest. Do you have any comments on that? I think that's often something which practices do already, and that's something which sort of predates the pandemic and this sort of thrust towards telephone consultations. I don't think there's an absolute requirement for that. I think the understanding is that if you don't have a, a telephone recording system in place, that your records need to be contemporaneous and accurate. That's equally true even if you do have a telephone recording system in place. Um, I think the important thing is that if, if you are recording consultations, 
uh, that patients are aware that that's a possibility. Um, they should know that their, their telephone recording is to be recorded. It, it is often helpful to have a recording uh, of things with patients, not least because if, if a patient complains about something, then having that verbatim recording is something which doctors can then fall back and rely on. Having said that, in the absence of a telephone recording, provided you've made a good and contemporaneous clinical record, I think your position in terms of defending yourself against complaints and responding successfully to complaints is just the same as if there was a recording. Uh, the, the, the quality of the record keeping is what's important there, irrespective of whether there's a, a, a voice recording available. I don't, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, thanks, Ed. There's a, there's a few questions about, uh, we've talked about recording from a doctor's point of view, but there's a few participants who've asked about what to do if patients want to record or if we find out that, that patients have been recording um, the consultation. Yeah, and that, that, again, that's something which is, uh, predates, um, predates the pandemic and this thrust and this move towards remote consultations. Um, we are often asked about patients who perhaps have brought their own phone into a consultation and set it on record, uh, even in a face-to-face -face setting. Um, the fact is, I think, for the most part, patients are, have, have a right to do that. The, the data that they are recording is sensitive personal data, but it's sensitive and personal to them. It, it's, it's their data. It's not the doctor's data. The doctor has a particular role in that, in the sense that they are consulting with the patient. Um, my view of that is that the doctor generally has, has nothing to fear from it. Uh, doctors who act professionally and responsibly and consult using their clinical skills will often come out of that very well. And again, it's, it's often protective to the doctor that that information is there. For the most part, patients, um, I think, record those consultations because we all know that the amount of information that, that is retained by a patient after a face-to-face -face consultation with a doctor is relatively small. I mean, the percentage of information that the patients retain immediately after the event can be surprisingly small. That may be even less if, if they're consulting by a, a technology which is unfamiliar to them and where they're perhaps worried about maintaining a connection. So the reason that patients, for the most part, record those consultations is for their own reassurance and as a reminder. Uh, it, I think it's rare, and I, I'm not sure that I've ever come across a situation where patients have chosen to use that in any way maliciously or to catch a doctor out. Um, doctors, I think, for the most part, will be reassured that patients are not having any sort of malintent by that and that it is for the patient's reassurance and own benefit. Uh, but of course, if you are aware that a patient has recorded something covertly, you can raise that with them and explain that you're happy to be recorded. Um, one option which has been suggested in the past is that you ask for a copy of that to be made available for the medical record, which can be, I think, slightly disarming for the patient. There's no reason why you can't ask, although, of course, you can't force that, that suggestion. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Just to um, develop that a, a little bit more, I just have one additional comment, which is uh, I know that people are very uncomfortable about recordings, and we've had some some comments in the chat about that. I think I should sort of flag up the GMC's consent guidance, which is going to be updated on the 9th of November, and specifically um, mean, uh, asks us as doctors to facilitate the recording of discussions, albeit specifically about consent, if if um, if patients would like that, so I think it's it, it is the kind of new world we've got to get used to. Although many of us certainly find it uncomfortable, um, there's a, a couple of other related issues that have come up about how to manage sort of supervision of trainees in remote consultations. Would you have any sort of comments on that? Um. I suppose I, mean, I touched very briefly on the issue of training, and I think the important thing there is that trainees will will need to become familiar with this as part of their training, because I think it is it is the way of the future. It is something we're all going to have to get used to. I think in that situation, it's it's certainly in the context of the pandemic and the distancing that might be required. There are practical difficulties. Um, but I think the technology should be able to be over to, to overcome that. I think much as I said in terms of whether there's a chaperone present or whether there is a 
a person present at the patient's end. If there are third parties present for any purpose, I think it's important that the patient is made aware of that. So if you're, a, for example, a consultant or a GP trainer, training a junior doctor, um, whether you're sitting in on their consultation or whether you're sitting in on their consultation, as long as patients are made aware of and are in agreement with the presence of a third party in a training role or in a trainee role, I don't see that there's a particular problem with that. Much as, as I say, you would do in a face-to-face -face setting, you wouldn't necessarily have a consultation where there was a, a third person present in the room for training purposes without explaining to the patient who that was. And I think as long as that, that is explained to the patient, most patients are very happy to be involved in the training of junior doctors. Thanks, Ed. And we've had a, a really interesting sort of comment from a, a, a paediatrician sort of uh, wanting to be clear that, that we're not sort of saying that everybody who's under 16 must have a face-to-face -face assessment. Uh, I, I don't think that that's really what we're saying at all. I think it's in, it's in those sort of circumstances where you might have a concern about why someone's asked to have a, a consultation without their parents or there's something else that unsettles you. Uh, I think our message is really simply be mindful of that rather than saying that you must consult everybody who's um, who, who's who's a child face to face. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's important. You know, there there are many consultations with with children and, and those under sixteen, which can be very successfully dealt with by remote means. Um, and that's that's whether there's a parent or an appropriate adult present or not. I think the concern is that if there's a child attending entirely remotely, that in itself might raise a concern. If there's no adult present, you might wonder why that's the case. And it's it's what I said about doctors trusting their own instincts in these situations. Um, particular paediatricians will have a very, very sharp antennae or very, very sort of attuned antennae for safeguarding and, and that type of issue. And in those situations, you will have a low threshold for asking for the patient to be seen face to face. But that's that's not necessarily the, the general rule. Some patients will be entirely appropriately seen in a remote setting, and that's you know, particularly straightforward if there is a parent present. And of course, the, the presence of a parent in itself does not mean that there isn't a safeguarding concern, uh, and the same thresholds and the same antennae would be, be would be twitching in the usual way. Hi, Ed. there's another question that's come in um, from one of our members. If a consultation is recorded, should it be released if there's a, a subject access request in the future? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that's fairly straightforward. If a consultation is recorded, it then does become part of the medical record. And any information that you hold about a patient, whether it's in the medical record or indeed elsewhere, um, is caught by a subject access request. So that should be released in the usual way. Um, with the usual sort of caveats about things like third party data and, and the likelihood of serious harm if that becomes relevant. Uh, but yes, it, it's, it's part of the record. It's information that you hold about the patient and it should be disclosed in the usual way as part of a subject access request. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. And um, it was just a, a comment, really, that we're getting a lot of um, concerns about the issues of patients recording consultations. I think the really difficult point about this is, is that as the law stands, the patient does not require our consent to record us during a consultation. I did a pile of telephone consultations yesterday, and all of those patients could have recorded me without having my consent for the the personal use, the Data Protection Act doesn't require it. Now, if you're in a situation where the, the kind of recording is kind of a small part of a dysfunctional relationship, there's absolutely nothing in you kind of talking frankly about that, asking the patient why they want to record you uh, and, and externalizing and dealing with the, the kind of problems, but I'm afraid I, I can't give you more comfort on whether it's illegal for them to record a consultation because unfortunately it's not. So. Uh, Ed, I don't know if you've got any observations from sort of general practice in, in that setting. 
Yeah, I think I think the key point is there that is that the the law is what the law is. Uh, unfortunately, that 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 the, while we need consent from a patient, the patient doesn't need consent from us. Um, it's their data which they're recording. It's not our data. It's data which we are providing to them about their health. Um, there will be dysfunctional relationships, unfortunately, with with some with some patients. Some patients are difficult. Um, I think what protects individual doctors' interests in that situation is that no matter how difficult and dysfunctional the relationship is, by acting professionally and and remaining sort of above that and not not engaging with the dysfunctional element of it from the patient's perspective, your interests are protected if they then choose to record that consultation for perhaps ulterior motives. I get the impression that that may be bringing us close to the time when we said we would finish in any case. I don't know if there are any more questions that Ed or Sam want to raise. Hi, Ed. It just, um, we've had a few things coming through on consent and um, I know we're really coming up to time, so I thought I'd just try and, and, uh, and deal with those just to say that um, there's new GMC guidance on consent now available for inspection on the GMC website. That will go live on the 9th of November. We've had a lot of questions about aligning kind of paperwork, etc. And, um, you know, there's certainly nothing wrong with you sending out information to patients, documenting what's been sent out, maybe asking them to sign and return consent forms, etc. I, I guess the main message of the GMC consent guidance is that we're going to be moving on to being assessed on whether we've documented a meaningful discussion with the patient. So if you've had a detailed telephone or video consultation and you, you've had discussions about the options for treatment, why the patient wants to go down a particular route, and you've captured that in a letter, that will be really helpful um, in, in, terms of, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of capturing that consent. Yeah, I agree. I think I can. Uh, the GMC guidance, as I, I think, I would commend that to everybody so that they're aware of it in advance. Um, but I think the important thing about consent is that it. And I, I touched on this during the presentation. It's not a, a sort of a signature on a form. It's not a fixed point in time. It's all about the process of consent, the discussion about the issues, the ongoing engagement and the ongoing interaction and discussion between clinician and patient. Um, and I think as much of that as can be documented as possible, uh, whether it's in the clinical record or in follow-up letters, uh, the more the better, I think, is the, is the answer to that one. So on that basis, I think we've come to an end. Um, this is the time we said we would finish. I would like to thank everyone for their questions. Thank Ed and Sam for, for fielding them. Thank you all for, for joining. Um, as I say, if you did join late, the, the presentation is available in full uh, and will be made available on our website, I think, next week. Certificates of attendance will also be sent out, I hope, next week. Um, thank you very much, and I think at that point we will bring things to an end. <laughs>